Okay, uh, so let me introduce the speaker. Uh, so today we have Vincent Vargas from the University of Sorbonne Barry Perinot. So Vincent is in uh, well, uh, is, is in CNRS and has been uh, in uh, recently in ENS and before that, uh, I think in Dauphin. And uh, he's, he's an expert in uh, probability of um, Gaussian free field and multiplicative chaos and many, many, many other things. And today he's going to talk about uh, conformal bootstrap in Liouville theory. <clears throat> okay, so. Thank, thank you for the introduction, Antti. Uh, so, I mean, what I'm going to discuss is, is, is something that roughly started uh, five years ago uh, in Helsinki when we were writing on a board with Remy and Antti uh, asking uh, uh, what is Uville conformal field theory? At the, at the time, we didn't have a clean definition. And, and since, you know, we started this stuff uh, five, five, five years ago, uh, we're still working on, on Newville theory, and uh, I'll try to to explain what is our uh, what is our program, and, and, and in some sense, the talk today is is kind of uh, the final step of of, of, of the, the program we initiated five years ago. Even though, okay, there are still lots of things to do on Newville theory, but on the Riemann sphere, uh, we pretty much uh, wrapped up uh, our program. So this will be the, the topic of, of my talk. So along the way, okay, so we, we started this five years ago uh, with Antti, Rémi Rod, and, and François David actually, who helped us a lot. And uh, uh, the talk I'll be, uh, the talk of today will be uh, also joint work with Colin Guillermo, who helped us on one aspect of this program and who was of course of great help. Uh, so let me start, ah, I can't, no, yeah, I can't. So let me start with the context. So um, uh, this talk will be about a special Euclidean quantum field theory. And, uh, you know, Euclidean quantum field theories, they, they model statistical physics. And uh, what is important is uh, in, in these statistical physics models are fields. And uh, the physical content uh, is encoded in, in, in expectation values of products of these fields. And these are called uh, correlation functions. Uh, I was wondering, okay. And um, when you look at statistical physics at critical temperature, they're expected to be modeled by very specific quantum field theories that are called conformal field theories. And uh, these conformal field theories are just quantum field theories with a certain number of, uh, of symmetries. Uh, in particular, these theories, they, they, uh, they have symmetries when you apply conformal maps to them. And uh, so there's, so in 1984, there's this very, very uh, important paper by Belavin Polyakov Zamruchikov, who observed that when you look at quantum field theories with extra symmetries, well, you, it constrains the, 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 the correlation functions a lot. And so uh, they started, initiated a very ambitious and, and a program, which was to classify all the conformal field theories. So essentially to classify all quantum field theories that have conformal symmetry in two dimensions. So everything I'm saying today is, is in two dimensions. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and, and so in two dimensions, they were able in their classification program to give explicit expressions for a lot of conformal field theories, including you know, minimal models and, and in particular the critical Ising model for those who know. Now the only mention, the only time I'll mention three dimensions and it's for this last sentence, it's just to say that conformal field theory was a thriving field in physics in the eighties and nineties. And, uh, and I mean, there's still lots of research in 2D uh, conformal field theory, even in physics today, but uh, there was a, a, a kind of spectacular revival of the field recently where these ideas of Pelavin, Polyakov, Zamorochikov were, were adapted in three dimension by people like Richkov and collaborators to, 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 to start classifying 3D conformal field theories. So 
uh, just to say that it's still an active research field in two dimensions, but also uh, in three dimensions where, where, where physicists are trying to, 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 to classify to things in, in, in the same spirit as two dimensions. Um, but okay, three dimension is still a, a no man's land for, I think, in mathematics. Even two dimensions, I mean, it's, there's still lots of things to do. And so I'll be talking about one specific conformal field theory, which is the Liouville conformal field theory. Okay, so let me schematically kind of uh, summarize things. I mean, so what is this conformal? So on one side, you have an axiomatic approach to conformal field theory and even quantum field theory. Uh, but specifically for CFT, it's called, there's a, an axiomatic approach called the conformal bootstrap. And in some sense, it gives you rules to, to construct and compute correlation functions. Uh, on the axiomatic side, you also have other axioms uh, called like the Siegel axioms, which have a geometric flavor. But to, to summarize, uh, there, there's one approach which is really axiomatic. And there's a second approach to quantum field theory and conformal field theories, which is uh, constructive, which is essentially based on statistical physics models or, or probabilistic constructions uh, like path integrals. And uh, in some way, uh, uh, these, two, these two approaches, well, it's, it's rather hard to reconcile them to show that, okay, they both exist and, uh, and that they both match. And this is the program that we kind of uh, initiated and that we're, we're trying to, that we finished actually here on, on the Riemann sphere, this is, which is this talk. It, so it's, we constructed for one, so a family of conformal field theories called Uville theory, we constructed a path integral uh, and we showed that it, that it matches the construction, which is uh, called the, conf the conf which is the conformal bootstrap, which was introduced by uh, so BPZ Belevin Polyakov Zamalchikov in 1984. So this talk is about what? It's about explaining what is Liouville field theory in the path integral. How do we construct this object actually? And then how do we relate it, and how do we show that it's the same thing as the conformal bootstrap? So the first thing I'm going to say in this talk is I'm going to explain what is this conformal bootstrap approach to Liouville. And then I will, uh, I will explain what is the path integral construction of Liouville. And then I'll try to explain how you show that both are the same and what mathematics lie behind this identification. So it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's non-obvious identification as, as I hope we'll, you'll, you'll see. Okay, so let me start roughly with what is a 2D conformal field theory according to BPZ? What is a conformal field theory in this axiomatic conformal bootstrap approach? So roughly it's a bunch of fields that I'm gonna call V alpha I. And these fields, you can take them. So it's fields which depend on the point. So ZI is on the Riemann sphere, is lying on the Riemann sphere. So I see this as the complex plane with a point at infinity. And so, what, what it is, it's a bunch of correlation functions, these products of V alpha I, ZI. And now the conformal field theory tells you that these correlation functions, they have to satisfy some certain number of axioms. Now, one of the axioms is global conformal invariance. And what does this say? It says that if you take a Möbius transform on the sphere, so Psi of Z equals AZ plus B over CZ plus D, if you change your correlation functions and you take them at the points psi of zi instead of zi, you see the same thing, you recover the same thing times a product of psi prime zi to some power. And this power, which is denoted minus two delta alpha i, is called the conformal weight. So this is the conformal, the global conformal invariance statement. So in fact, I'm going to hide something under the rug and specialists of conformal field theory are, are going to complain if there are some in the audience. This is global conformal invariance. In fact, when you do conformal field theories, you assume a stronger conformal invariance statement, which is a local conform conformal invariance statement called the veil anomaly. I'm not gonna state this because I'd have to introduce background metrics on my Riemann sphere. So here I just wanna keep things simple. 
And so I'm just going to state the global conformal invariance uh, axiom. And now, if you have this conformal invariance, well, since if you take three points on the Riemann sphere, you can always send them to zero, one, and infinity by a conformal map. There are three degrees of freedom uh, on the sphere. And so using this conformal covariance statement, you can show that if I take three points, the three point correlation function of, 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 um, on the Riemann sphere, it's equal to some constant that I'm going to denote C alpha one, alpha two, alpha three times these products. So Z1 minus Z2 to some powers, Z1 to Z minus Z3 to some powers, Z2 minus Z3 to some powers. So this is easy to show. I mean, if you take the left-hand side and you divide by these powers of uh, the difference of the point ZI, well, if you apply a Möbius transform, well, you can see that it doesn't change the result. And so roughly the left-hand side divided by the powers on the right-hand side is a constant. And this constant is called the structure constant of the conformal field theory. So this is actually some, 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 an input you put in your theory. If you want to define a conformal field theory in this axiomatic conformal bootstrap approach, what you do is you first say by saying the three point correlation function on, on the Riemann sphere, uh, it's some constant and this constant you have to put as an input some, some value. And what they do in physics is that they say that these constants, well, they satisfy some formula called the DOZZ formula for Uville theory. Now for the Ising model, uh, there are only two, so there are three fields. And, uh, and so you can also define the constants. I think it's one half. If you look at what, what goes on when you take the correlation between the Ising spin and the, the energy density, so it's something like that. And so, but in Uville, it's called the DOZZ formula and it depends so on, you know, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, that's the indexing of your fields. And uh, Uville theory is going to depend on two parameters, gamma and mu. So here I, I stress the dependence on gamma and mu and we'll see later what, they, what it means uh, from the path and typical perspective. So that's the first series of things that physicists do to construct conformal field theory. And it's, it's kind of an art to, 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 do, to, to guess what is supposed to be these structure constants. Because you can't just plug in anything. You need, you need these, you, you have consistency conditions uh, behind these constructions. Okay, the second axiomatic that people use in 2D conformal field theories, it's called the operator product expansion. And roughly what it says is that, so I have, I, I, when, I, when I construct a conformal field theory, I want to construct the correlations of lots of fields. And uh, so we just saw that the three point correlation function, it's just a constant up to some global function, which is explicit. And so what you wanna do is then construct the higher order correlation functions. So the fourth order correlation functions, the fifth order correlation functions, et cetera. And what you do is you, 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 the axiom is that when you take the product of two fields, it's the sum over some basis. So alpha belongs to S and it's called the, the spectrum. It's the sum of V alpha I, Z I's and times something. And so, so uh, uh, a series, which depends on alpha, alpha one, alpha two, on the points Z one, Z two, and on the differential operators. So the, the differential in Z one and the differential in Z one bar. So this is a, I'm taking, uh, so this is an infinite series in the parameters, in the, the parameters Z1, Z2, uh, partial differential Z1, partial differential Z1 bar. So I'm, I'm using complex notations. So this is just a standard complex derivative. Okay. And when you have this, so look at, look at, um, so I, I wrote it down for Z1 equals zero. So here, here you see an expression, sorry. So here you see an expression of what it looks like. These, so it's an infinite series, which depends on the points Z and on, on, and, and on the differential operators. And so it depends also on the parameters alpha, alpha one, alpha two through the, the conformal weights that I introduced just before. So you see that 
and so it's given so this this uh, operator product expansion it's something which depends on the model and it's this structure constant you see here c alpha one alpha two alpha bar times and something so an infinite series in differential operators and this is a something which depend doesn't depend on the model it's something which is intrinsic to uh, all conformal field theories it only depends on what is called the central charge of the model. And so uh, what they do is they plug in this asymptotic expansion into the correlation functions. And so you see that if, for instance, you have a four point correlation function, it reduces to the, uh, an infinite sum of differential operators which act on a three point correlation function. And so you, 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 have, a, and so you have an expression that way for the four point correlation function. And you keep on, you know, using this asymptotic expansion and you get an expression uh, for the five fifth point correlation function, et cetera. And that's why it's called the bootstrap because bootstrap means that it means recursive. So you recursively construct your correlation. And so, as I said, uh, solving a conformal field theory uh, in this axiomatic approach for a physicist, it boils down to determining the spectrum. So the sum of indices on which you sum and the structure constants, which are these C alpha one, alpha two, alpha bar here that, that I haven't found. Okay. <clears throat> and so just to mention that uh, when you do that, you can expand around the point alpha one, alpha two, but you can also expand differently by making Z one go to Z three in, uh, in these correlation functions. And you'll get seemingly a different expression, but they have to match. And this consistency condition is something that con strongly constrains what you're allowed to put for your conformal weights delta alpha and for the structure constants C alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. So you, you can't just plug in what you want. You, you have then these consistency conditions that, that they use in the bootstrap construction. Now, in this talk, uh, so as I said, for physicists, what is Liouville? It's an explicit expression for the structure constants, which is called the DOZC formula. And it's uh, so an expression for the conformal weights that we'll see, and it's uh, the spectrum. And in Uville, the spectrum is Q plus I R plus. So I is the complex imaginary number, R plus is the, the half real line. And Q is, uh, well, we'll see that uh, in Uville theory, there's a, it depends on a parameter gamma and mu. And Q is related to gamma by the relation gamma over two plus two over gamma. So, uh, okay, this is, uh, so this was a, a 15 minute crash course on what is a bootstrap. So, but all you have to re, you know, take home, the, the take home message that the, is that the conformal bootstrap, it's, it's, the, it's giving two things, three point correlation function through the structure constant, which is something which is fixed by fixed by global conformal invariance and uh, uh, some an expansion rule. When you take two pro a product of two fields, you expand it along one field and you have this infinite series of differential operators. And this is a, this is a rule which depends on the structure constant and, and something which is uh, defined by, by conformal invariance. All right, so this is a, uh, the bootstrap approach. Now, let me jump into Liouville. So, uh, so <clears throat> what is Liouville conformal field theory in the path integral approach? Okay, so for those who are a bit lost with this bootstrap approach, you can start, you know, fresh on this slide because I'm going to describe during 20 or 30 minutes what is Liouville conformal field theory, not in the bootstrap construction, but in the, the the, the path integral construction. So I'm going to consider uh, a metric on, on the Riemann sphere. I'm going to take one over Z to the power four, uh, actually Z plus, which where Z plus is max one and uh, modulus of Z. So this is just a, um, a metric on the, the Riemann sphere, which has its curvature uh, uniformly uh, distributed on the, the unit circle. So it's a very, you know, uh, symmetric metric. And uh, so in this context, Liouville conformal field theory, it's so formally, it's a measure 
or a uh, on a or it's um on on some space of maps from the complex plane to R defined by so if I take the average of a field f of a function f which depends on my field phi, well it's the it's the integral of exponential minus s of phi d phi where d phi is supposed to be a uniform measure on the space of functions and s of phi is called the action so you see it's uh, Liouville field theory it's it's a Gibbs it's a Gibbs measure in, in the language of statistical physics on an infinite dimensional space which is uh, the space of functions and what is this action so you it's one over four pi the integral of the gradient of phi to the square so this is the familiar uh, quadratic action there's also a linear term which is 2q phi times g plus the interaction term so this is a kind of a trivial term this linear term and you have the interaction term which is really you know the heart of Liouville field theory which is 4 pi so mu so mu is any positive constant so i put a 4 pi here but okay uh, i can i can switch mu to 4 pi mu it's a it doesn't matter but for renormalization after i, I took 4 pi see exponential gamma phi g of z and I integrate this whole thing against the Lebesgue measure. So dz is the Lebesgue measure on the complex uh, complex plane. And the linear part depends on q and q is related to the gamma here by the relation q equal gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma. So formally Uville CFT it's a Gibbs measure on an infinite dimensional space with an action which is the familiar quadratic term plus an exponential. <clears throat> okay, so what we did, so it was not five years ago, it was actually six years ago, I guess, uh, we're getting old. Uh, what we did uh, in 2014 with so Francois, David, uh, Antti and Rémy is that we constructed, we, get, we gave a clean probabilistic definition to this formal path integral. And so the squeeze, the, um, the clean definition, it is based on two ingredients. It's first that we interpret this gradient square term as a Gaussian free field. So this is kind of standard uh, in, in constructive uh, quantum field theory, though we'll see that there's kind of a subtlety when we deal with Liouville. And we interpreted this term, the, the interaction term as a, we, we, we take it as, an, as a radon nicodym derivative with respect to the Gaussian free field measure. And so we have to give, make sense of the exponential of the Gaussian free field. And to do that, there's a theory which was already uh, developed in 85 by Jean-Pierre Cahan, and it's called Gaussian multiplicative chaos theory. And this is what I'm going to describe in the, the next few slides is in more detail what I, what I said here uh, on how to construct the Liouville conformal field theory. So first Cree ingredient I said is that we need to give, make, give a meaning to this gradient square term here in our quantum field theory. So this is rather standard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Gaussian free field with vanishing G average. So remember that G is just this function on the complex plane. It's one over Z plus to the power four. So what, what we do is you take the green function associated to this metric. So it's the inverse of the Laplacian and the inverse of the Laplacian is the green function. It's this G of ZZ prime and the G of ZZ prime, it's explicit on the complex plane. It's just log one over the, the distance between the Euclidean distance between the points minus one fourth log G of Z minus one fourth log of G of Z prime. Now, uh, once you have a green function, you know, it's a positive definite function with a singularity, but it's a positive definite function. So you can put a Gaussian random variable, a Gaussian random field rather behind the green function. And so it's not defined pointwise because of this singularity on the diagonal when Z equals Z prime, this is infinity. And so what you get is that the Gaussian free field, it's the Gaussian field whose covariance is G of ZZ prime. And in mathematical terms, what you can do is you can integrate it against test functions, but you can't take it pointwise. 
So it's a distribution, it's a random distribution in the sense of Schwartz. And formally, we say that it, it's just a random field with covariance given by this g of zz prime. So, but this is an abuse of notation, mathematically speaking, because it's not defined point. -wise. <clears throat> and so now that we defined uh, this, the Gaussian free field, the definition of the Gaussian measure is that if I, so if I take a, a continuous functional f, uh, which takes a field which lives on h minus epsilon, say, so uh, rec recall that h, h minus epsilon is not a function, it's a, it's a distribution in the sense of Schwartz. So if I average my, my function with respect to the field, with respect to this formal measure, I, I said as a definition that it's a constant times the average with respect to my Gaussian free field plus, and here's the subtlety that, uh, you know, plus a constant that, I dis that is distributed against according to the Lebesgue measure, okay? So, what I say is that in constructive field theory, uh, what we say is that this Gibbs measure, which corresponds to Liouville field theory with mu equals zero, say, it's nothing but a Gaussian random generalized function plus a constant distributed according to Lebesgue. Okay, and so uh, you you see, for instance, that it's not a probability measure; it's it's an infinite mass measure. Okay, because of the Lebesgue measure here. So actually the average of the random fields which are behind the Liouville field theory, it, it's an infinite, uh, it has infinite volume. If, it, if, you, if you integrate one, you find infinity. So this is a specific feature of Liouville and, and it's behind lots of confusions uh, on this theory. Okay, so that's the definition of the Gaussian measure. And then as I said, I take my Gibbs weight Okay, and I write the first two terms times the gradient square term. And so I see that I interpret this term as a Heidel Nicodem derivative with respect to my Gaussian free field measure that I just defined the previous slide in the previous slide. And so what you have to do is just make sense of this exponential term. And as the Gaussian free field is not defined pointwise, it, this has no meaning. So you have to renormalize. And a proper definition would be rather to say that it has exponential gamma x minus variance over two. And so this is what is what Kahan actually did in 1985, is that you say that um, you define the exponential of the Gaussian free field. So how do you do that? Well, you regularize your field at scale epsilon. So you introduce an ultraviolet scale, an ultraviolet cutoff uh, at scale epsilon you regularize your field, so you get a good smooth Gaussian field whose variance, whose covariance on the diagonal is like log one over z minus z prime plus the little ultraviolet cutoff. And you, so you, you take the exponential and you take out exponential minus gamma square over two, the variance, which is actually of the order log one over epsilon. You take out this counter term and you go to the limit. And what Kahan showed is that if uh, you take gamma into zero two, this thing converges to a random volume form on the complex plane, which has total, which has a total fine, uh, total mass, which is finite almost surely, and um, and uh, especially what he showed is that this random volume form is non-trivial, meaning it's not the zero volume form on the complex plane if and only if gamma is in zero two. And this is why up to now, uh, uh, Uville field theory, we can only tackle it uh, for gamma between zero and two when we use probabilistic tools. It's because if we want to make sense of this uh, interaction term, it's non-trivial when you try to define things in a probabilistic manner, only if gamma is, is in the interval zero two. And so once you define this exponential, you just put it, you just take exponential minus this, uh, this total mass and, uh, and it defines the Liouville uh, CFT. So here's the clean definition of the Liouville CFT is that if I take a function which, is def which 
which lives on h minus one, h minus epsilon of the complex plane. Uh, if I take an average with respect to the, the Liouville conformal field theory uh, a path integral, well, it's the integral over R of the Lebesgue measure times exponential minus two QC. So remember, so this corresponds to the linear term here. And this term is corresponds to this term. So I get, I take the average with respect to my Gaussian free field X of e to the minus mu, so mu is positive, it's the positive cosmological constant, exponential gamma c times the total mass of my Gaussian multiplicative chaos uh, random volume form. So we see that Uville field theory depends on two parameters, gamma, which is up here in the interaction, but it's also here in the linear term, in the q term here, so remember that q is related to gamma by the relation Q equals gamma over two plus two over gamma. So there's actually, so this is a function of gamma and there's an independent parameter of, of gamma, which is mu, but mu is strictly positive, okay? Okay, so, and in this context, we actually like to work with a flat background measure. So we shift the field and the Liouville field is the constant plus my Gaussian free field uh, under this measure, minus two Q log of G of this. And this is the observable. This is, okay, we're gonna take the exponential of this thing. And this is actually the, uh, the, the random fields that we'll be, we'll be interested in our, uh, in our statistical fields approach. Okay, so, so now, as I said, what we want to take for, for F is exponential alpha the, the field. But you see uh, exponential of the field taken at a point, it's not something which is defined on any H minus epsilon of C because it corresponds to taking the field pointwise at a point Z. And we know that it's not defined the Gaussian free field at a point. So here there's once again, a renormalization procedure, uh, which is, um, which is, uh, required to make sense of the product of these exponentials. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, but it can be done. We can, uh, by, we, can, we can renormalize once again these guys under the Liouville conformal field theory measure, and we obtain a probabilistic expression, which I'm going to describe in the next slide. And just for people who come from quantum field theory, there's no big mystery on how we renormalize uh, these fields. We renormalize them exactly the same way we renormalize the volume form, the Gaussian multiplicative volume form, we just uh, take out uh, the average of this exponential, which since everything is Gaussian, corresponds to taking out variance over two. And this is in quantum field theory, the standard Vick renormalization. So it doesn't go beyond Vick renormalization, uh, this business. Okay, so the theorem is that by renormalizing these vertex operators, uh, we can consider the product of exponential of the Liouville field at different points under this Liouville conformal field theory measure. And we obtain something which is non-trivial if and only if uh, the alpha i are real and satisfy what are called the Seiberg bounds because they were di discovered actually uh, by Cy Nathan Seiberg in the 90s. And uh, these bounds are that all the alpha i's have to be rather small, so smaller than Q, which is two over gamma plus gamma over two. And, but the sum of the alpha i's have to be bigger than two Q. So we have these two conditions for these uh, correlation functions to make sense. If we don't have this condition, well, we can still renormalize and go to the limit, but we're going to find something trivial. We're going to find zero or infinity. And, uh, and so it's going to be uh, something which is trivial and which has actually nothing to do with Uville conformal field theory. So our window to enter Uville conformal field theory is actually via the Seiberg bounds here. And one can see that if you have these two conditions, so it's a very simple exercise I think everyone can do uh, in his head is that this implies that N is greater or equal to three. Okay, and so, uh, one can make sense of Uville conformal field theory correlation functions only 
when we start putting more than three points. <clears throat> and, uh, but, in some, but usually in conformal field theories, the two point correlation function also has a meaning, but in Newville things are a bit subtle. You need to put in three, four, five points uh, to make sense of, of the correlation functions. Okay, and so especially what is nice, and so, and what, what you can show is that the probabilistic construction, if you apply Möbius transforms to the ZK, ZKs, what you see is the same things times the, the, some powers of Psi prime with the minus two delta alpha. And these weights are, are given by this formula, alpha over two, Q minus alpha over two where we call Q is gamma over two plus two over gamma. So we, we also get to identify the conformal weights. So remember what we do is we show our correlation functions. They actually satisfy the first axiom of, um, of conformal field theory uh, in the bootstrap approach. And so in particular, it also satisfies the second one, which is just a consequence of the, of the first axiom. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so that's, and just to make things concrete, uh, we actually have a probabilistic formula for these correlation functions. And we show that, well, up to trivial, a global fact, a global function, which is completely explicit in the, the point set case, the correlation functions in Uville, it's nothing but the average of some random variable to the power minus s and S is related to the alpha Ks by the relation sum equals sum of the alpha Is minus two Q over gamma. And Z is a random variable. And what is this random variable? I take the exponential of the Gaussian free field, the, the Gaussian multiplicative chaos volume form, which I denote M gamma DZ, and I integrate this function against it. So uh, roughly one over Z minus Z Is to, the, to some powers here. This gives me a random variable. I take a fractional power of this random variable and I take the average. And uh, this, is an ex this, this is the explicit expression that comes out of our construction for the Liouville correlation functions. And so you see that uh, we are, our, our entrance in, in Liouville field theory is really to say, okay, for certain values of alpha i's, what we can do is we can give some kind of clean probabilistic expression of what should be Liouville field theory if we were to interpret correctly uh, the path integral. And at the end, it's rather concrete. Liouville conformal field theory correlations, it's nothing but the average with respect uh, of a, a random variable to some, some power minus s. Okay. And once you have this expression, now you can start playing and say, okay, I have an expression, it's explicit. Can I recover what the physicists call Uville conformal field theory in their bootstrap construction? Now, remember, what, what the first thing we checked is once we have this expression, the first thing we checked is that if we apply Psi, a Möbius transform to the points in the complex plane, we see the product of the Psi prime to some conformal weight, okay? And this, this is something we can prove. But then uh, the question is, now that we have this uh, conformal invariance, this global conformal invariance statement, we know that we can send the points to zero, one infinity, and that we get this constant, which, which is explicit in probabilistic terms, okay? But the question is, well, physicists, they have an explicit formula for the, the, the three-point correlation functions when the points are sent to zero, one infinity. And this formula is called the DOZZ formula. And I'm not going to give you this formula in this talk, but it's a very, I think it's fair to say that it's a very complicated formula, uh, which, which involves a special functions from number theory. And um, well, I think it's a very beautiful formula, but it's a question of taste. And it's, I actually put the formula in the last slide of this talk in case someone wants to see it. Uh, and but I'm not going to give it here because it's, it's, it's rather complicated. Um, but what we did is that this formula that they plug in the bootstrap and then you know, use the bootstrap machinery to construct higher order correlations, well, it's, satis it's, which, it, it's equal to the three-point correlation function 
that we have constructed via the path integral and probability theory. And so the statement is, and it's an old statement for us. I mean, it's a theorem we proved in 2017 and it took us two years to prove it actually uh, with Antti and Rémy. We can show that the three point correlation function that we constructed at point zero, one infinity. So it has an, an, uh, th these kinds of explicit expressions. It is the DOCZ formula that you see written everywhere in physics. <clears throat> okay, there's a one half here because there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a, glo th 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 these, these structure constants are defined up to a global constant. So this one half here, it's just because of our convention in the, when we construct the path integral. Ah, there's a question? No, okay. Uh, is, 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 are there any questions by the way? No, okay. Yes. Yes? Yes, what does D-O-Z-Z -Z stand for? So D-O-Z-Z -Z stands for, uh, so I just wrote it here, the D-O-Z-Z -Z formula in case you want to see it. D-O-Z-Z -Z stands for Dorn, Otto, so, uh, uh, not the Otto who's, a, who's following this talk, uh, though he's done lots of things, but not the DOZZ formula. So it's Don Otto and ZZ, I think people can guess. It's Zamolochikov, Zamolochikov. Thank you. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a formula which was discovered in 1995, roughly, independently by Don Otto, Zamolochikov, Zamolochikov. So you see, it's this kind of crazy formula. Uh, with a, what is called this epsilon function. It's, a, it's an explicit formula for the UVA correlations at three point. Okay. Thank you. Can I, yes? Can I, can I ask a question? Sorry. So if I take the new going to zero limit, yes. do I recover a probabilistic construction of the free boson? Uh, yes, well, cool? I mean, okay. the best way to see this is on, you, so you see the little hand here that, uh, Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yes, so you yes, see, I, can see. I mean, if, if, if you want to take the free boson, okay, mm -hmm. you need a neutrality condition. Right. Okay. And the neutrality condition is S equals zero. Mm -hmm. And see if S equals zero, well, you take the average of a random variable to the power zero. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you see, you get the correlations of the free boson. I see. I see. Interesting. So, you know, uh, it, that, that that's the, that's that's the way uh, I, I would I would explain how you recover it in an easy way. The, the free okay. okay. I also have a question. Yes. Um, uh, actually, two. So, first question: Are the B the vertex operators themselves probabilistic observables or? or yes. Uh, you can integrate them against little balls, and you get random volume forms. Okay, and that's because they have sufficiently low dimensions. Yes, it's because if you take alpha i small, if you take alpha i too big, you don't have any more the probabilistic interpretation. Okay, but in your range, there are really probabilistic objects. Yes, we, we, because we, that's always the, the problem. If you have in conformal field theory operators with higher dimensions, then yes. they can't can't be moments of some measure. In some exactly. There's, 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 I mean, it's really important to understand that. Uh, when you enter Liouville field theory by, by, um, by probability theory, you have bounds on, 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 on what fields you're allowed to look at. And you can only see very specific fields. Whereas in physics, they take alpha in the spectrum. And in the spectrum, it's, it's Q plus IP. So it's typically what, when people do bootstrap constructions, the fields they look at are outside of probabilistic, uh, interpretation whereas uh and so we have to kind of recover the bootstrap Hello. Hello. through our probabilistic window okay. thank you that that's a good, uh, good yes i had another question about yes. the the dozz formula from what i remember is derived using um coulomb gas integrals so it's not just guessed so is, is your integral for this z in the, in the end uh, also a kind of Coulomb gas integral? No, so the pro so 
Okay, of course. I mean, uh, the examiner Chikov, when they guess, they're always right. So there's a reason. No, no, no. But the, 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 there's a, there's some integrals you, you do. It's not yes. Just what integral. what they do in physics is they take minus s equals integer. Okay, and if minus s is an integer, then you can use the standard trick of the computation of of moments with an integer. You know, taking uh, uh, if you take an entire moment, so the expectation of a variable to the power n, where n is a natural number, then you can, you see Coulomb gas integrals and they, they do some kind of analytic, they guess the analytic continuation. However, let me just stress this. This is not the topic of my talk with the OZZ formula that much, but let me just say that we do not at all uh, take, we can't use these, uh, make rigorous these kinds of arguments of analytic continuation. We use a completely different road. We insert degenerate fields and we, we kind of uh, implement in a probabilistic manner ideas of Teschner on uh, how you recover the DLZZ formula using the Belavin Polyakov Zamolochikov formulas. So it's, a, it's really, I mean, uh, we do not use the uh, Coulomb gas type methods to prove the DLZZ formula. And that's what took us so long actually to prove. We rather implement uh, uh, what is called Teschner's trick. So, uh, but won't have time to explain all that. Okay, and so this can is I, the second, yes? Can I also ask another question related to those of Stefan? So you're always looking at the vertex operators, but I suppose there are other probabilistic fields you could look at like phi itself. It, yeah, but it won't get, it won't, it won't be, it won't have the conform, it won't be a, um, it won't be a primary field. I mean, it won't, it won't have the conformal invariance though. You could, but what is meaningful is, I, I mean, if you look at fields which uh, are, I mean, what you, when you look at, at, at this thing, okay, you want fields which satisfy these axioms, right? Okay, and it happens to be the exponentials. If you take phi, you could look at this, but uh, it, it's not a primary field in the sense of, um, of conformal field theory. and. Uh, Actually, when you look at, say, the, the scaling minimum of, of random planar maps, we know that the KPZ conjecture says that these correlations will describe, of the exponentials, will describe the limit of, of planar maps. But phi, I don't know if it has something, I mean, if it's particularly interesting to look at, because it's, it's not, it doesn't have the conformal invariance property. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, and so the second, so this is the topic of today's talk. Uh, I'm, 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 I won't have time to go into much details, but uh, uh, what we proved, uh, we just put on archive yesterday, the, the actually the, the optimal theorem, uh, or maybe it appeared today. <clears throat> so if I take gamma and zero two, this is a limitation of probability theory. I need gamma and zero two. If I take alpha i less than q for all alpha i, so this is for my probabilistic construction to, to make sense. And if I suppose that alpha one plus alpha two is bigger than q and alpha three plus alpha four is bigger than q, then if I take z smaller than one, the four point correlation function taken at point zero, z one infinity, my probabilistic construction, well, it matches the bootstrap construction and the bootstrap construction says that the four point correlation is up to a global constant, which is meaningless, one over eight pi, never mind. It's the integral over the spectrum. So remember, the spectrum is when I take alpha equals q plus ip, typically values of alpha, which are outside the range of what we do in probability theory. So what it says, the bootstrap, is that the four point function, it's the three point function taken at alpha one, alpha two times. Q minus IP, so P is real here, times the three point correlation function taken at alpha three, alpha four, Q plus IP, some fractional power of Z times what is the global conformal block, which will depend on P and, all, all, and actually on all the conformal weights, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four. Sorry, there's a typo. Here it's an alpha four for the fourth field. This is a typo missing an alpha four here, which corresponds to this alpha four here. here. So a conformal block squared and I integrate against the spectrum. 
And what is this FP? Well, it's called the holomorphic conformal block. It's a, it's a holomorphic function. Uh, so it's defined by a, a, an infinite series whose radius and, of convergence is one, okay? And what are the beta n? The beta n are, have complicated combinatorial expressions in terms of Young diagrams. So there's lots of representation theory behind the definition of these beta n's. Okay, so actually, um, so what I wanted to say is that we stopped you know, in, in uh, here in this talk on at the four point function, but actually what we elucidated is, is the general mechanism which enables to construct recursively the correlation functions. And so one could prove similar expressions for the five point function, the six point function, et cetera. Okay, and so what is rather neat, okay, for us in this theorem is, is that uh, what I didn't tell you in the beginning is that the conformal bootstrap approach in physics actually, well, it's, it's something that is, uh, it's the approach that is used by people in, in mathematics who do representation theory. And so uh, these, these conformal blocks have been studied uh, uh, recently a lot uh, in, in the physics uh, literature, but also in mathematics literature by people working in, 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 in uh, representation theory. And in particular, I would like to highlight two works around these conformal blocks by uh, Maulika Okunkov in 2012 and Schiffman Vasco in 2012. So they work in the context of the torus, but 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 never mind. And uh, in these representation uh, work theory works, uh, the conformal blocks are seen as a formal power series in the in 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 the z variable. And what is nice in 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 our approach in our probabilistic approach is that we actually show that these conformal blocks are really not just formal power series, but actual uh, holomorphic functions. So we work in a uh, so we're able to show that this it's a it's a pro, uh, an output of our work it's a it's a it's a it's a corollary of our work that actually this this general bootstrap expression it's not just a formal power series in Z it's actually a real uh, these are real holomorphic functions and this is a real number okay which actually coincides with our probabilistic construction and so uh, for people who know there's a there is a, a an explicit expression for these conformal blocks, which is called the, which is the, called the Nekrasov partition function, and and actually identifying what physicists call conformal blocks in the Nekrasov partition function is under active scrutiny in the uh, in 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 the in uh, the community working on representation theory, and uh, uh, and that's what actually Mauliko Kunkov, Schiffman, Vasco did. Is they kind of showed, in some sense, the the AGT conjecture. Okay, which is relating the conformal blocks as they are written in the physics literature and, and, and the Nekrasov partition function, uh, which is a, a different, seemingly a different model, but actually it's the same, same thing. <coughs> so, okay, so we, we have a probabilistic expression for these bootstrap correlations. And also uh, there's a program right now going in Columbia University on actually giving probabilistic expressions for these conformal blocks here. So this is, a, there's a first paper on the archive by Gozal, Remy, Sun, Sun, who have obtained beautiful probabilistic expressions in the kind of same flavor as our, as we have obtained probabilistic expressions for the correlation function for the conformal blocks. Okay, so now yes. I'm running out of time. Yes? I'm sorry. So these expressions for the conformal blocks are quite universal, right? Because the conformal blocks are kinematical objects. So we are supposed yes. to for any, okay. They're exactly, so this, the, the, the spectrum, the R plus here, I integrate over Q plus IP, okay? Mm -hmm. Q is fixed plus IP, I is imaginary number, P is in zero plus nine. So this is, depends on Newville, okay, mm -hmm. the DP. This is the spectrum. Right, right. The three point correlation function here and here, okay, the DOZZ formula depends on Newville. Right. But this thing is universal. Right. It only depends on the conformal weights and mm -hmm. the central charge of the model, which is one plus six Q squared. So it's right. an, it's, it is, and, and it's given here. So it's, it's a rather intricate 
uh, I won't have time to go into the detail, mm -hmm. but it's a rather, uh, it's a, it's a non-explicit expression actually. And in it, it, it in, in, in the beta ends, mm -hmm. uh, this, this, so this, this holomorphic function is a series. And so the coefficients of the series, it's a sum over pairs of young diagrams of same, of same, of same size mm -hmm. and times a function of, you know, the conformal weights and also, uh, and also it, it involves an inverse matrix uh, and uh, which is called the shape of the Shapovalov matrix. So I won't go into the details, but it's, it's related to the scalar products that you put on the highest weight representations of the, the Vieja Soho algebra of your theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, okay, this is just words now for, for the audience, uh, for those who don't know, because I don't have time. I, I only have five minutes left. But mm -hmm. what people have to, uh, to, really to take home is that it's, it's, it, it has a strong representation theoretic uh, definition, mm -hmm. uh, content, these, these conformal blocks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is our main theorem. And uh, it took us uh, 100 pages on archive to prove this. So how do I take 100 pages and put it into two slides with five minutes left? That's, uh, that's my, my challenge, which I think I'll fail to do correctly, but I'll nonetheless try to give you kind of little hints of, of the proof. Okay, so the proof boils down to uh, three steps. So, <clears throat> The three steps are the following. I'll try to explain the, where the P comes from, the, the integration over P, real. So remember my, th my four point correlation function, I have an explicit probabilistic expression in terms of the Gaussian free field. Now, roughly, if I take my Gaussian free field on the complex plane, I can average out, I can condition my Gaussian free field on its value on the circle, okay? And if I condition on the value of the circle, I can split my four point correlation function into a scalar product of two vectors. So roughly the Hilbert space, it's, 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 it's given by the data of the value of the Gaussian free field on the circle. So I condition on that and I can split my four point correlation function as some kind of average with respect to two of the product of the scalar product of two variables, which depend on the value of the Gaussian free field on the circle. So behind this stuff, for those who know, there is the concept, the crucial concept of OS positivity. Now, once I write my four point function, my four point probabilistic function as a scalar product, well, I decompose on a basis. And you know, when you're in, in, in on the real line, there's a natural basis generalized basis, which is the, the which are the Fourier um, um, functions. So the, the E to the I P X. And here there's a kind of similar thing going on is that I can decompose my Hilbert space on a basis. And this basis depends on P. This is the Fourier mode. It corresponds to actually the C integral in my Buville definition. So it's a, I can construct a basis which depends on P uh, and on two young diagrams, nu and nu tilde. And it's not, it, 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 these, these functions, these, these functions psi, th these wave functions, if you want, they do not, de they, um, <clears throat> they, uh, they are not in my Hilbert space, just like E to the I P X is not in L2, right? Uh, the Fourier, but it is it belongs to the Hilbert space in a generalized sense. So meaning that if I take the co the, the scalar product of my two fields, I see the direct mass P equal P P prime, just like a Fourier basis. And when P equals P prime, I it, it's uh, it, it, the, the scalar product it's times these scalar products called the Shapovalov form. That I, I, I that, in, that appear in the in the in the conformal block. So the take-home message is that we can construct a, a basis which depends on p, a real parameter, and on a pair of Young diagrams. Now, once you do that, well, 
scalar, I just take, this is like the Plancherelle formula for in Fourier analysis, the scalar product of my two vectors here, I expand it along this basis. Now, since the basis is not orthonormal because of this term, okay, it's not an orthonormal basis. It's a basis which is orthonormal in the P variable, but not in the, the, the Young diagrams. So when I, I apply Plancherelle, I get DP, but I also have to take the inverse of these uh, scalar products on the Young diagrams. And this is why there's these minus ones here hanging, because I'm projecting my two vectors on a non-orthonormal basis. And then the third step of, my, uh, of the proof is that I try to compute the scalar product of my vectors on this basis. And this is where uh, conformal word identities come into play. And so here there's something rather, you know, a bit tricky is that to compute this scalar product, I don't know, we don't have a probabilistic construction of this basis, okay? So what we do is that we replace Q plus IP by alpha and we make alpha very negative. So we get a probabilistic interpretation of this scalar product. We compute using conformal symmetry, this scalar product. And then we use an, uh, an analytic continuity argument to deduce the value of this scalar product when at the point where when Q, when alpha equals Q plus IP. And at the end, well, it's, okay, it's a, I, this is really a brief summary of what we do. At the end, we can compute this scalar product and we can relate it to the three point function. So the DOZZ formula times powers of Z See, so, and times explicit functions of the conformal weights, this V that I, uh, this, v, this V function, which is explicit in the conformal weights and the Young diagram that appear in the conformal blocks. Okay, so in the definition of the conformal blocks, I, the Q minus one comes from the fact that I'm working in a basis, which is not orthonormal. And the V here is it, a reflection of the, the conformal invariance of my system. Okay, so that's roughly the take home message is that we take our probabilistic construction and we, 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 we condition our Gaussian free field by its value on the circle using, and, and it splits our four point correlation function as a scalar product. And, uh, and then we, we expand the scalar product on a Fourier type basis. And we compute the, 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 the scalar products with this Fourier basis using the conformal symmetry of our system, of our, of our, of our theory, the so-called conformal word identities. Okay, so I'm running out of time. I'm going to finish with this slide. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, just by giving you an explicit expression for my Hilbert space. So as I said, what is the Hilbert space? Well, the Hilbert space is L2 of R times omega so R is, it's corresponds to um, the fact that in Uville, you see when I construct Uville, I integrate over DC. And what we do is that we condition, as I say, the Gaussian free field by its value on the circle of radius one. And so if we do that, we can split the four point correlation function as a scalar product. And what we get is that we, we can, uh, interpret the four point correlation as the scalar product of two vectors in this Hilbert space. So R corresponds to the DC variable and here the omega corresponds to my Gaussian free field on the circle. Okay, and then what happens is that we have a, a, a Fourier, our basis depends on P and on Young diagrams. And so the Young diagrams, it's a discrete set and P is a continuum set. And so why is that? So the continuum, the Fourier part of our basis comes from the fact that we're working with this infinite measure, the infinite measure, the bag measure DC and the discrete spectrum, the discrete part of the spectrum, these double Young diagrams come from the fact that we're working in a compact probability space here, omega. And so it gives you a, <clears throat> a basis which is going to, to have a Fourier part and a discrete part. Okay. I don't have time to go into the details of, uh, of, of all these, uh, these things. And uh, I'm just going to conclude by a, a, few, a few perspectives by saying that, okay, we were able to prove the, 
the conformal bootstrap on the Riemann sphere, and now we're working on the modular bootstrap on the torus. We expect the same kind of ideas to come into play. And uh, okay, well, there are lots of other things going on around this nouveau conformal field theory by by ourselves, but also by uh, by people like Kozal, uh, Remy, Sanson, Julien Gibeda, Guillaume Bavrez. Uh, we're also uh, working on higher genus generalizations of of what we're doing. Uh, as far as I know, I am. And so I'm, I'm going to finish with, uh, with this slide. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Maybe we can, everybody unmute and thank Vincent for the talk. So are there more questions? Uh, I have a question, uh, Jan Dereżyński. At the beginning, okay. At the beginning of your talk, uh, there was a, a metric which was quite uh, peculiar. It, uh, a what? The metric, metric time. The metric. Ah, the metric. This one. Yeah. So, so it uh, uh, it was uh, non-differentiable on the circle. Yes. So, uh, what is the reason of this choice? Does it matter? Or, um, well, okay. The first thing is that we can put any background metric because of uh, of uh, the fact that these correlations, uh, if you change the background metric up to a global constant called the veil anomaly, the theory is the same. So you choose any metric you want. And yes, this metric is particularly symmetric. You see, when you decompose your Gaussian free field uh, on the in the complex plane, it, it's 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 the sum of a uh, with this metric, the Gaussian free field is it's it's written here. It's very symmetric. It's 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 a Gaussian free field with Dirichlet conditions in the unit disk, plus Gaussian free field with Dirichlet conditions in the complementary, and it has this invariance in law here, plus the harmonic extension. This metric corresponds to a very symmetric Gaussian free field, which enables really to here to to, to, to factorize the four-point correlation into two pieces in a neat way. Thank you. More questions? Uh, I also have a, a minor question. So this uh, expectation that, that you write, is it is it a probability measure or is it is it is it obviously a finite measure because there was no normalization constant? So is it which one? Uh, the uh, bracket, the uh, this thing. Uh, yes. This is this is an infinite measure. Okay, so the DC. I mean, there's an exponential that looks like it could make it finite, but it it doesn't. Take if you take c equal minus infinity. This term goes to zero. So this thing goes to one. So when C goes to minus infinity, this, this thing here is equivalent to exponential minus two QC. So when C goes to minus infinity, this thing is blowing up like an exponential. Mm -hmm. so, so it's an infinite it's measure. So it's an infinite measure. Okay, that was my question. Yes, beyond, compared to you know, what you do when, when you work, uh, you know, sign Gordon in a finite volume, be, what's behind this is an infinite measure. More questions? Okay, if, if that's it, uh, thanks again, Vansa and uh, uh, is Jochen still there? Who, who, what is our next? Uh, what's the next talk in our series? Uh, I think uh, Eisenman. Uh, yes, Eisenman. Exactly. In um, December, I don't recall exactly. December, um, December ten, I suppose. Okay, I will send an email. All right. Okay. Thank you, and bye bye. <coughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.